Good morning, everybody. Good to see you today. Thanks for being with us. Uh, I was thinking about y'all this week as I was at one of my kids' volleyball games over at Princess Anne High School, uh, boys' volleyball. Uh, we did beat Salem and Cox this week. It's not important, but if you uh, go to those schools, just thought you'd want to know. But I, so I was, at, I was at one of those games, and I noticed something. I noticed that I was not taking any pictures or videos of my kid while they were playing, which seemed normal to me until I turned around and looked to my left and there were all sorts of parents taking pictures and videos of their kids, which immediately made me feel bad about myself as a parent. So I had to come up with an excuse for why I was okay, you know, even though I wasn't doing what I felt like they should be doing. And here's what I realized. I realized that the parents who were taking the photos and the videos and they were FaceTiming and grandparents or whomever, they were taking those pictures of their kids who, who were a little bit younger and they weren't really in the rotation as much. And so uh, it was a bigger deal that these kids were we're getting to play. Now, I can, I can resonate with that because when I played basketball in high school, I was a part of what we called uh, the Minutemen, which meant if our team was up 20 or down 20 with a minute to go, four of us would get to play. That was like my little crew, you know, we would, uh, we would get to be on the Minutemen. So, so I was watching them thinking, okay, well, you know, that's, that's why it's fine that I'm, you know, neglecting to have any memory of my child playing sports in the future. Just kidding. We took all our, all our pictures game one. But wh wh why does that matter? Why does that matter for us? Why why did, I th why did I think of you? Because I was thinking about those of you who are like regulars around here, not just to church, but like to Grace Bible Church, you know where to park, you know how to check your kid in, you know how to sneak out during the end of the last song, you know all those sorts of things, beat the traffic, right? Uh, you know all that. That's just sort of old hat. You're not like taking pictures and videos. It's just sort of what you do. But some of you, you're, you're newer. Maybe you're, you're newer to church. Maybe you're newer to Grace Bible Church in particular. And if that's you, I'm, I'm really glad that you're here today because we're gonna be talking about what it means that we're the church and, and specifically this idea that we've been unpacking the past few weeks, that the church is Jesus' people together on mission. Now, over the last few weeks, we've looked at a few different ways this phrase could be sort of parsed. So we've talked about Jesus, We've talked about people, we've talked about together, we've talked a little bit about mission, but we haven't really put them together to talk about Jesus' people. Like, who are Jesus' people? What does it mean to be one of Jesus' people? Now, if, if you're a regular here, and you, you've been a, a Christian a long time, you're, you're like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm in the Jesus' people group. I am glad that you are here, and I hope to give you maybe a different way to think about what it means that you're a part of Jesus' people. But if you are here and this is new for you or, or you're sort of maybe coming back to church, I wouldn't blame you if when you think about the phrase Jesus people, you don't necessarily get warm fuzzies. I wouldn't blame you if some of you wonder these sorts of things. Are Jesus people all political, judgmental, irrelevant if when you think about Jesus' people, you think about these things, I don't blame you. Now, I do want to tell you, um, according to Jesus, the answer is no. Uh, that might not be your life experience, but if you're wondering, yeah, are they? Well, according to Jesus, no, we're going to go with what Jesus says. But even more specifically, here are the two questions I'd love to answer for us today. Number one, who are Jesus' people? And then secondly, what does he want us to do? Who are Jesus' people and what does he want us to do? And so the way we're going to answer this today is to look at one of my favorite books in the Bible. So, so in, the, in the New Testament, the New Testament is largely letters that were written to churches. And so Peter was a disciple of Jesus, and Peter was a leader in the early church, and he wrote some letters to churches in the New Testament that we call First and Second Peter. And First Peter, I'm telling you, if, if you're not a regular Bible reader, or you're thinking maybe you should be, First Peter would be a great place to start. I'd highly recommend it to you. I, I love First Peter. And nestled in First Peter chapter two, Peter answers these questions I want to look at today in a way that we might not expect. So we're going to let Peter talk to us about what it means to be Jesus' people. Okay, First Peter chapter two, verse nine goes like this: But all y'all which is uh, maybe not in your English Bible, but is what Peter actually said. But all y'all, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. 
Now, why did I write all y'all? Well, I have, I've said a few times now that it is a million dollar idea sitting out there to write a Southern English translation of the Bible. We don't have one, right? And the reason this would be so valuable is that the New Testament was written in Greek. And in Greek, it is very clear when you're talking about the second person singular or the second person plural. But in English, we just have the word you. And so when Peter, when you read in your English Bible, but you are a chosen people, you don't know if Peter's talking to you specifically as in one person or y'all as in all of us together. And I want you to know today that Peter is talking about all y'all. All y'all are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. All y'all got special possession. Now, why is this important? It's important because Peter was a Jewish man writing predominantly to Jewish followers of Jesus. Remember, remember in the first century, Jesus was Jewish and Jesus' disciples were Jewish. And then when Jesus died and rose again, all of these Jewish men and women put their faith in Jesus and then they became Christians. But when Peter is writing to these Jewish converts to becoming Christians, he wants to remind them. He wants to remind all y'all of their connection to their history. So when, when Peter says, but all y'all are a chosen people, to the, to the Jewish believers in the first century, they would have known that that's a reference to Israel as God's chosen people and that the church is the new Israel. The all y'all and Jesus are the new chosen people. You're a chosen people. You're a, a royal priesthood. Well, all of the first century hearers of Jesus, they would have known that in Israel, the priests were the people who represented the nation to God. And now in Jesus, y'all are priests. All y'all priests, all y'all have direct access to God through Jesus. You're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, that now the church is the new Israel. All y'all are included. Well, I was thinking about how we could understand what, what he's trying to get at, that all y'all are all these things. And, and I thought, well, some of you are gonna like really, really like be into the whole Jewish history thing. You're like, oh yeah, Jewish history, I love that. And then some of you are gonna be more regular people. And, uh, and you're gonna think, I don't know, Eric, can we move on from the Jewish history? So I was thinking, okay, how can I illustrate this? And I thought, oh, I got it. And I remembered the great theologian Steve Martin actually illustrated this particular truth brilliantly in his classic movie, The Jerk. So if you're not really into the Jewish history, maybe Steve Martin can help us unpack what Peter's getting at in 1 Peter chapter 2. Go ahead and take a look at The Jerk. I wish I could get that excited about but Nothing? Are you kidding? Page 73, Johnson, Maven, R. I'm somebody now. Millions of people look at this book every day. This is the kind of spontaneous publicity, your name in print, that makes people. I'm in print. Things are going to start happening to me now. Things are going to start happening to me now. This is a phone book. I thought some of you might not have seen one before. So uh, you, you, you used to like get excited in that movie. He's excited about getting in the phone book. Now we try to pay to keep our names out of the phone book or uh, you know, off. But, but why is that clip so funny? Well, it's so funny because it's ironic, right? It's not actually special to have your name in the phone book. Everybody got their name in the phone book. Now, if you do have a white pages at home like, like we used to have when you had all the names in there, that's apparently very valuable because we tried to buy a white pages and it was like $60. So if you're a person who has stacks of white pages at home, um, we have a group for you on Monday night. Um, that's the first thing. And, um, and you could sell them and, and make a bunch of money. But, but that, that's not the point. Here, here, here's, here's the question when we think about Steve Martin. Is my name in Jesus' phone book? Is my name in Jesus' phone book? Is, is your name in Jesus' phone book? And how do you know? How do you know if your name is in Jesus' phone book? Well, Peter tells us. Look, look back at verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you. 
And this little phrase, that you, is incredibly important to this verse. If you, if you were just reading this for yourself, you might blow by that you. No, that you matters. Because he's explaining all y'all, the chosen people, the royal priesthood, all y'all, y'all were created for something. In fact, the way you know you're in the all y'all is that you, that you what? What do the all y'all do that makes them part of God's chosen people? Look at the rest of verse nine. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. The first thing we need to see is that when you are a part of God's special people, it is so that you may declare his praises, declare the praises of him. I wanna encourage you today, I wanna challenge you to think about how you relate to this idea of praise welling up inside of you, thanksgiving to God, gratefulness to God for what he has done for you. The distinguishing marker of followers of Jesus is that we are people who are filled with praise and thanks to God that he has what? Look back at the verse. That he has called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Do you have a sense in your heart that you are thankful for the fact that you were in darkness and he saved you and brought you into light? See, Jesus people don't take that for granted. When Jesus people think about the fact that they have moved from darkness to light, they declare the praises of him. They declare the praises of God. Now, in the first century, in the first century, the people who were hearing this from Peter, they would have had an understanding, they would have had an understanding that they were created by God and that they were accountable to God. Again, first century, predominantly Jewish people. They would have had a cultural understanding and a specific religious understanding that they were created by God and accountable to God. So when they recognized that they were accountable to God and that they needed to have sin forgiven, the fact that Jesus did that and offered to bring them out of darkness into light would have been good news. Well, in our world today, we don't live with a cultural awareness of the fact that God created us and we're accountable to God. In fact, we not only lack that awareness, but our felt darkness, our felt darkness that we're trying to get out of and into light often has nothing to do with God. The problem, however, is that we are trying to treat a symptom when Jesus came to actually give us a cure. Now, what are some of the ways that we're trying to treat the symptoms of being in darkness. I, I, made, I made a list of some of them. For some of you, the darkness that you feel that you're trying to escape is the darkness of just simply not being skinny enough. There are millions of people who are trapped in their own minds, in their own hearts, in the darkness of feeling that they are worthless because of their size. And it's a darkness that is unforgiving and un relenting. If you, if, you, if you don't resonate with that, I'm, I'm so glad that you don't. But there are many who are thinking to themselves, if I could just be this size, then I would have value. There are others for whom it's money. If I could just have a little more, if I could just provide a little more for my family, if we could just do a better vacation, if I could just have a more secure retirement, if I could be rich enough, then I could get out of this darkness of financial insecurity and I could come into some light. And there are people with millions and millions and millions of dollars who are trapped in the darkness of financial insecurity. Maybe for you, it's, maybe you want to be popular, right? We think of wanting to be popular as like a middle school, high school thing, but it's not. It never leaves us. Some of us so want to be liked by others that we'll do anything to fit in. And the problem is, as long as your darkness is how much you want to be liked and loved by others, you'll never have enough approval. It will never be enough. Maybe you just want to be good enough. Maybe you just want to feel like you get it right all the time. You just want to have a sense that I'm worth something. 
whatever you're looking to, to tell you you're good enough, will not ultimately fulfill you. So when Peter says, declaring the praises of him who called us out of darkness and into his wonderful light, he would say to us today that all of the darkness that we feel, it's a symptom. It's a symptom of the fact that we were created to have a life-changing relationship with our creator. See, if you think to yourself, if I could just be thin enough, Jesus would come to you today and say, no, no, come out of that darkness when you recognize you were created by God. You are a child of God. Your worth is in Christ. Come out of that darkness. Find your worth in Christ. Come into the light. If you want to have enough money, you know what Jesus can do? He can give you the miracle of contentment. Some of you don't believe it. But you can actually be content with what you have when you find your value in Jesus. You're not popular enough. You're chosen by the creator of the universe. I mean, you want to have like the most popular person in the universe on your side. You have that in Jesus. You want to be good enough? How about remembering that Jesus came to take our sin and give us his righteousness when we come out of darkness and into his wonderful light. The reason that we can be overwhelmed and full of praise for God is that we recognize that through the miracle of Jesus, he has called us out of darkness and into his wonderful light. And that's how you know that you are a part of Jesus' people. Jesus' people are those who what? Declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. We never want to lose sight of the fact that because of Jesus, we have moved from darkness to light. It's what it means to be a Jesus people. And I want to ask you today, in your heart, are you grateful? Are you thankful for the fact that Jesus saved you? And invites you out of darkness and into his light, not because you were good enough, smart enough, thin enough, rich enough, popular enough, but simply because he loved you. And as Christians, especially those of us who've been Christians for a long time, we can never lose sight of the miracle that we were once in darkness and have brought brought into the light. And if you are not a follower of Jesus, please, 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 please don't think that what Jesus invites you to do is vote a certain way or do this certain thing or work harder or try. No, no, no. What he says to you is believe, have faith that I offer you forgiveness and a way out of the darkness. And when you recognize that this internal sense of wrestling that you feel, this unsettledness, when you recognize the power of moving from darkness to light, it will change everything. Now, as Peter was writing to his church, in in verse 10, he, he says these words. He says, once you were not a people, remember he just said you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood. Once you were not a people, but now you're the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy out of darkness into the wonderful light of him. Now, what Peter's original audience would have known that you might not know is that this, this fra- these phrases in verse 10, they're actually a quotation from the Old Testament. See, all of Peter's Jewish hearers who'd come to faith in Jesus, they would have all known, they would have all known that Peter is actually quoting from the Old Testament. Specifically, he was quoting from the Old Testament book of Hosea. In the Old Testament, there are these series of books, we call them the minor prophets. They're the last 12 books of the Old Testament. Hosea is the first of the minor prophets. And Hosea, as a prophet, received a word from God and then gave that word to the people. That's what prophets did in the Old Testament. 
And when God would deliver his word to a prophet to give to the people, sometimes God asked them to do really crazy things. Like there's this story in the prophet Ezekiel where God asked Ezekiel to lay on his side for like weeks and weeks and weeks and months and months and months and to cook over his own dung. He was supposed to use his own poop as fuel, and Ezekiel didn't like that, so Ezekiel asked God to negotiate, hey God, how about I use cow poop for fuel? So he laid on his side and cooked over dung for like, you know, almost a year to get God's message across to his people. Crazy stuff, right? I'm telling you, it's in the, it's the Old Testament. You should try to read it sometime. It's not as boring as you think. It's actually some really interesting stuff. So, so here's the deal with, with Hosea. Hosea, is, it's wild what God asked Hosea to do. God, God asked Hosea, this prophet, He asked Hosea to marry a woman who was promiscuous and who he knew would be unfaithful to the prophet of God. God asked Hosea the prophet to marry a woman that God and Hosea both knew would be unfaithful to him so that God could demonstrate to Israel how great his love was was to his people. I I want to read it to you from Hosea chapter one, verse two. We read that when the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. See, all all throughout Old Testament history, God refers to Israel like a bride. And he's saying to his people Israel, you have been unfaithful to me. You have been living in the darkness. And he's going to use Hosea to illustrate how he thinks about people walking in darkness. Verse 3, so he married Gomer, the daughter of Dibliam, and she conceived and bore him a son. So he marries this promiscuous woman. They have a child together, and she continues to be unfaithful. We skip ahead to chapter three. We read this. The Lord said to me, this is Hosea writing, go show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes, which is a symbol of their idol worship. So God wants Israel to know that he loves them so much that just like they have been unfaithful to him, so is he calling Hosea to love this faithless woman and to return to her. And the verse that Peter is quoting actually is right at the end of chapter 2. Peter is quoting this verse where he says in Hosea 2.23, I will plant her for myself in the land and I will show my love to the one I called not my love. And I will say to those called not my people that you are my people and they will say you are my God. And Peter quotes this in verse 10. Look again at verse 10. Chapter 2, verse 10. Peter says, once you were not a people. This is just right out of Hosea. But now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy. But now you have received mercy. How do you think Hosea's wife felt when he continued to love her and be faithful to her and pursue her and to woo her back? What level of gratitude would have welled up inside of her that she could receive forgiveness and reconciliation with her husband despite her unfaithfulness? And Peter is saying to the church and he's saying to us today, look, You were in darkness, and through faith in Jesus, you come into the light, forgiveness, life, love, hope, a future. Just don't forget. Declare the praises of him who did all of these things. 
And that's what I wanna encourage us to do when I think about applying this to our church specifically in this church series. As Jesus people at our church, as Jesus people at Grace Bible Church, we wanna be people who remember. We wanna remember that we were in darkness and he has brought us into the light. That's why we talk about our core values of grace and humility and also teamwork. Why? Because we remember that we are always people who need grace. That we can relate to one one another with humility because he has brought us out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Look, as soon as we forget what Jesus has done for us, as soon as we start to think, ah, my sin wasn't that bad, I'm actually pretty good, you know the first thing to go? The praises of him who called us. That's why the encouragement today is that Jesus' people are people who remember what he has done and who declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness and into his wonderful light. But here's what's unique about our church. We are not just a church who remembers. We are also a people who care about people still in the dark. See, the temptation for all of us is not just to forget that we were once in darkness. The temptation is for us to get so caught up in declaring his praises and so glad that we live in the light that we forget that Jesus came to bring more people out of darkness and into his light. Jesus came to bring more people out of darkness into his light. And in our church, we care about people who are still in the dark. In our church, we who remember are willing to sacrifice for the sake of those who do not yet know. That's why we talk about trying to create a church unchurched people would love to attend because we remember and we care. Now, side note, the the technical phrase is we want to create a church unchurched people would love to attend. Sometimes people shorthand it and they say, yeah, we're a church for unchurched people. I appreciate the sentiment. It's not technically true because the church is for God. We are his church. We are Jesus' people on, together on mission. The church isn't for unchurched people, but we want to be a church that is thinking about, loving, caring for people who have yet to discover how much God loves them. Look, if that's you today, I just want you to know we are for you. If you would say, Eric, I'm having a fine time today, but I'm not sure I believe. We are so glad you are here. Join us on your journey. It honors us that you would even consider being a part. And for our church, we want to be a people who remember that we were once in darkness and have been brought into light. And we want to be a people who care about those who have yet to come out of the darkness. So so as we think about what it means to be Jesus' people, let's be people who declare the praises of him. Him who what? Who loved you so much that despite whatever you've done or wherever you've been, whatever your past, whatever guilt or shame you're carrying, he says to you, come out. Come out of the darkness and receive his love in his wonderful light. Let me pray for us. Then we're gonna celebrate new life baptism. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus today, and in Jesus' name, I thank you that you allow us to declare your praises. Thank you that when we were not loved, you loved us. When we had not received mercy, you showed us mercy. When we were not a people, you called us a people out of darkness into your light. May we always remember what you have done for us. And may your church always be a place that cares about those who have yet to know. And I pray for everyone listening today who's not yet a follower of Jesus to know, to know that there is a God who loves them and who wants to reach out and to offer them mercy and forgiveness and love and life and that you would fill all of our hearts with a desire to declare your praises. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.